Hello, and welcome to Idea London. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the crowd, so some of you have been here before. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm head of UX for Digital Business Labs, which is a program uh, situated over here at Idea London. Um, welcome to uh, Food Apps for Tech. Tech tech apps for food? Sorry. <laughs> UX for food apps? Got there. OK. <laughs> uh, we're really excited to be hosting this event um, with General Assembly. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do here and why it's situated here. Um, so what we do is we provide UX services for startups. Um, and so we help startups test their products. Um, at the moment, uh, we do, we, so we do this through three distinct services, a UX consultancy, a device lab, and an app lab. Um, so a, a device lab is our, our uh, device library, which is London's largest, which startups take advantage of for, to, to test on a bunch of different devices. And app lab, which is a private app store um, that we use on the UCL community to distribute your apps to. So before you go public, you go on app lab and test on the UCL community of about 50,000 people. Um, so. I won't bore you anymore. I just want to tell you a little bit that we're hiring for we're hiring UX people at the moment. So the, there are some business cards which Peter has, um, and if you guys are looking for any UX roles, either UX architect or designer, in particular designers, um, we are looking for them. So great, thank you very much, and have a great event. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Laura from General Assembly. Um, thank you very much to Idea London for hosting us tonight. Um, if you're interested in kind of uh, learning any more about our courses that we teach, um, or if you're maybe even interested in partnering with us, as you probably know, we offer full-time and um, part-time UX courses. So um, if you think that's relevant, please come speak to me after. But anyway, without further ado, I will introduce uh, Dan from Uncover, who will give the first talk for tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our story about Uncover. Um, my name is Dan. I'm one of the three co-founders, and I'm head of product. A little bit about what Uncover is and kind of the big picture of where we are. Can you guys hear at the back? Is everything, are we OK? Go. OK. So uh, the core problem, we uh, got together. We are three co-founders who all did our MBA at London Business School, and we actually decided one evening to go out and kind of brainstorm ideas about what would it be like if we'd actually open our own company and what would we do. And being three blokes who really don't plan anything in advance, what we decided to do is go out and just have a, night, a fun night in town. We're, a bit of, we're kind of foodies, so we decided to go and eat somewhere. David, one of my co-founders in there, subsequently the CEO, said, well, I'm a big foodie. We don't need to book anywhere. I'll just find us a place. What we found was that we walked around town for about... I think it was an hour and 15 minutes, looking for a spot to sit down because it was Friday night. Obviously, everything was packed, and we literally walked from place to place without a place to sit. What happened was that at, uh, ultimately, we reached Social Eating House, which at the time was at the apex of its buzz and was doing very, very well. We walked in, kind of knowing there won't be a place, and the hostess kindly said that actually they just got a last-minute cancellation for three people. So if you want, we have a nice seat like, right inside, right in, nice, in a great place. And that's when it kind of clicked for us. We said, wait a second. If we would just had an app to do this, right? Everyone has that moment, right? If it was just an app that kind of told us where the good places are around us and, what, and could curate for us a list of, um, of the best restaurants in town for today, then that would simply solve this issue, which we felt as if we had quite a lot of. And then we validated it with a few friends of ours, which we'll talk about in a second. But then we went and did our homework and talked to restaurant owners and big hospitality groups. And what we found was actually this is a huge issue for them. Um, High-end restaurants or popular restaurants, if you'd like, not necessarily expensive ones, but the popular ones, can seat anywhere between 75 and 85% of their capacity on a given day by themselves. They don't need the open tables of the world. They don't need booker tables. They don't need anybody. What they can do is just they're so popular, people just call up or come in. But then there's, a, there's an optimization question, right? How do you get to that 100%? And because of high food and service and inventory uh, and land costs or, or overhead, most of these restaurants actually break even at around 60, 60 to 75%. So they need to constantly bring these people in every day. And this is why you hear about the best restaurants in town closing after three or four months because they can't uh, um, hold their head above water. So what we found was that actually last-minute cancellations and no-shows was the single biggest problem f facing... That 
that the uh, high-end restaurant or the popular restaurant segment was facing. And with that, armed with that, we um, conceptualized a solution, which is a last-minute booking service for these high-end, great quality, um, very, very popular restaurants. And the idea would be same day, and you can just come in, and there'd be those last few tables. So it would be the system both on, this is again a two-sided marketplace where we would go to a restaurant and say, you know, you have, a, you have your booking service, everything is fine, we're not changing any of that. But if you have that last-minute cancellation, pop it on another platform as well. Who knows, maybe you'll just get a, uh, a booking from it. So it's a completely different solution to the general inventory or general table management software that they're currently using. On the app side, which is what we're going to focus on right now, what we had was a very, very simple app with 10 suggestions for you, right? And this is a very strong curation play where we say there are 5,000 restaurants in Greater London. Out of them, we have chosen between five to 600. Out of those, we are showing you 10 because we know you so well, and we decided that this is actually what you need to see at this moment. Thereby, now at this stage, you're probably saying to yourself, why is this dude pitching me now? Right, what, what, what's up here? And the reason I'm telling you all this story is because our entire UX and everything, that, all of our decisions were made under the assumptions of the story I just told you. Right. We are an optimization or a distressed inventory play. We have made our UX decisions on the app based on the fact that when you come on Uncover, you are a same day prospective diner who, is make, who wants to make a fast decision. You are likely to spend anywhere between 50 to 70 pounds per person on your dinner tonight. And we have a very clear vision of what that person looks like. So many times people go on our app and say, you know, why can't I book in Coluccio's? And there's a reason for that. And why can't I, why can't I search and filter? A question we get all the time. Why can't I search through your app? Well, the answer to that is that we are not a search paradigm. We are a discovery paradigm. Right? We are about what is available right now next to you. If you know what restaurant you want to go to tonight, there are many platforms to do it. Here, here I am, the head of Uncover, uh, product of Uncover, saying go to Open Table and search. Right? You don't need me for that. You have a solution in the world for that paradigm. What we have tried to do is optimize for a different use case. So that's kind of an intro. So what did we do? Essentially, this is uh, how we proved the concept. Uh, we went to about 100 of our friends and collected a, a kind of behavioral traits about what, are, uh, what do you do when you have a last minute need? The first thing we found out was that everybody has a, 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 a last minute need quite often. No, people don't book as often as they used to. The second thing we found out was that everyone thinks he's a foodie. Everyone thinks he knows all, everything about the, restaurant, uh, the London restaurant scene. While the average person could not name more than 10 good restaurants in the city, everyone thought he was a foodie, right? So it's kind of, you know it when you see it. The, on the back of that, we went to restaurant owners and we said, okay, what exactly do you need from this uh, system? The first thing they said, it needs to be 100% automated. We said, okay, great. What's the next best solution, right? It's always great to start off from the best case scenario, but what, what's next, right? What, do you, what is the minimum amount of information you need to give us? And then they said, well, we need to tell you the table time. We need to tell you the date. We said, well, it's the day, right? We don't need the date. Table time, and we need table size, like the number of covers, so number of people at that table. So great. So if, we give you an interface that says the time of the table and the size of the table, and you just press a button. Is that good enough for you? And I said, that's perfect. So with, that's how we, we literally got off the ground. We had a, a single-page web view, which we gave to a few restaurants, and we said to them, just when you have a table available, put it on. Who knows what's going to happen? And today, restaurant owners are um, very good with technology, much better than they were before. I don't know if it's very good, but they're much better than they were before. <laughs> And they tweet and they do other things. So it was fine for some of them to do that as well. On the, re on the app side, what we decided to do was to use the customary uh, test flight um, um, uh, services that you have out there. We used another one specifically called Hockey App, but it's, it's an old, uh, like, pretty similar. And we solicited about 150 of our friends, or 100 to be honest, to, to download the app and just give us general uh, general guidance as to whether we are showing them the type of inventory they're interested in and what do they think. Now, 
what came out of that was four weeks. We did four weeks of testing on the back of what I just told you. I, um, we found a great student from UCL, actually, which is great. That's why it's great that we're here. A great um, student from UCL to build the app for us. Um, it took him, I think, three weeks to build it. It was very, very thin at the time. But it did have the core concept. And I'll actually show it to you in a second, because it's the similarities between the app that we built for, I won't tell you the sum, but it is low, uh, versus the app that we built 15 months later with after fundraising, a million pounds of seed, and so on and so forth, is actually remarkably very similar. So I will, I will show you those two. Um, this is what happened for the testing. We had four weeks, and we thought that, OK, we're going to make two, three, four, maybe five bookings through this a day. We ended up make, doing just under 300 booking, uh, diners to our restaurants. We asked everyone who went, because most of these people we knew, some of them were friends of friends or whatever, and we said to them, can you please give us the receipts or just email them to us so that we can have some um, notion of the analytics behind this. And what we discovered was that we generated about 12,500 pounds of incremental revenue to the restaurants that worked with us. And we had about 20 restaurants signed up at the time. So this was, this was also quite lucky. We, had, we found restaurants that were very, very generous and, and allowed their hostesses or hostess to um, use this platform, even though it wasn't very uh, proven. Um, and then what we did was we essentially said to people, okay, just use this as normally would, and let's see what happens. And what happened was that we actually created this amount of revenue for our restaurants. We, as a result of that, we, um, well, maybe I'll take one step back. What we did, being LBS students, we immediately built a business plan. That's what we know to do, right? Uh, business, uh, business students. And what we did was we said, okay, what are the KPIs that we have to hit or we have to show in order to validate a lot of these assumptions. A lot of them are around conversion rate and Unico app opens and whatever, but, uh, but some of them were non-trivial for us. For example, we did not think that people are going to open the app five times a day, right? And we tracked these users using Mixpan and everything else. I'm giving the, the specific uh, services we use just in case anybody's interested in that. And what we found was that people were opening the app five times a day. Now, I'll tell you a secret. We did not have, nothing changed. They opened the app, they saw exactly the same list every, every time they opened the app. So we interviewed them on the back of this testing and we said, you know, we, some of them we knew and we said, hey, uh, what, why were you opening the app five times a day? And he said, well, actually, I was just interested to see what's going on in the city. So there was an element of discovery. They felt as if something is dynamically changing and happening here. And the second uh, piece of insight there was that they said that a lot of our users said, I thought I was a foodie, and then I opened this app, and I, and I saw a list of 10 restaurants. I recognized one, which I knew was great, and, and then I didn't know any of the others. So I came in as an education or as a, um, as a means to discover new places so that when I decide to book, I can then go back to these and say, oh, yeah, I remember that Italian place in Shoreditch. I'm going to try that. And that was a completely different paradigm than what we actually thought. We thought access was a very strong element of this. What we discovered was that, that discovery was as strong a use case for us because of this notion that everyone thinks he's a foodie, but actually only a few people are. It's a very easy way to actually solve some of these issues. So we use that as well, and I'll show you now. So a bit about this, uh, I've been asked to focus on the actual learnings and what we've done so far. And I wanted to show that, so this is, the lion's share of what I want to uh, share with you today. So this is the app that we actually built. We were called The List once. But as you can imagine, The List is a nightmare on Google, right? Right, Googling The List. <coughs> so we did not end up using The List. Um, and we rebranded Uncover uh, during our launch. This was the prototype that we built. And this was the, uh, this is the app that's actually going to be released next week. So I'm giving you a preview of something that we, we actually are just launching, this bottom bar and everything. But, this is, this is the, the, the most final app that you can get. And some of these, <coughs> excuse me, and the reason why I'm showing you both of these is because they, these two, on the face of them, are remarkably similar, obviously. You can see here that some of the decisions that we made early on, we actually validated them going forward. That some others were actually not validated. And we could say, actually, we, we can um, attest that, that those were decisions that we had to drop. I want to give uh, three examples of tangible um, A-B tests that we did and we, what we discovered. The first is distance. So our app is a location 
based service, just like many of these rest, uh, many of these apps. And location is your friend when it comes to curation. People who are close to you, that's great. They write to people, um, restaurants that are close to you, bars that are close to you. But if you are a, desig a designation restaurant app like us, if somebody opens our app, he's willing to travel. We even have a uh, fancy Uber integration. You know, we somebody's willing to go and uh, pop on the tube and travel for 15 or 20 minutes to go to a restaurant that he's interested in going. However, if you suddenly give him the or her the distance in miles and kilometers from where they are, they're just put off, right? If I tell you, hey, it's a 20 minute tube ride, they're like, okay, well, whatever. If I say it's six kilometers away, like, wait a second, what am I, like, I, I don't want to go there, right? So we actually had that initially and we actually took it off simply because it didn't help our users. They just, if anything, it just depressed demand. The second thing that we discovered was that, and this is, um, this is I think, applicable to most food apps, the issue of price, right? So the, uh, we have a lot of uh, the internet discussions about price, but the one thing I can tell you about price as an insight is that price with your users is, is a discussion, right? It is not a fixed fee. It is something that you need to gorge. If you, use, if you use our app and go to one of these restaurants, I do not know how much you're going to pay because it depends on your wine preferences and whether you're taking three courses or a set menu, if you're going for lunch or for dinner, and so on and so forth. So the only thing I can do is really try to kind of give you an estimation of whereabouts you're going to fall in this thing. And what we did was, and, and, this, and we, uh, this is the best we can do at the moment, and there are probably better ways to do it, but this is our insight. You can see that we have pound signs at the beginning here, pounds out of five, and the first thing people say to us, pounds out of five, is it doesn't mean anything. And you're right, it doesn't mean anything, right? If I say five out of five pounds, you know it's on the expensive scale. If I say one out of five pounds, you know it's the cheaper scale. But what if I say, if I actually say, you know, three pound signs out of five? You said that, yeah, okay, that wasn't helpful. And if I say four pounds, if I just say, what is it, expensive-ish? Expensive-ish is a relative term to how much you're making that month, right? So that really doesn't help that much. But what it does give you is a very strong comparison between the different options. And that's why we did it, because it is an intuitive, relative index to the list you're viewing right, that, uh, right then and there. So this price estimation doesn't actually correlate to any point in reality as to what you're going to pay. It only uh, relates to the restaurant you just viewed a second before or the restaurant you're going to view a second after that. And that's a discussion that the price has within the list itself. If you click on any of these restaurants, and we'll do this in a second, then what you're going to see is that we give an average main course. An average main course, we've tried many different KPIs. The average main is an example of what we have found to be the most, e the easiest way for somebody to say, oh, okay, well, I'm going with my girlfriend, and it's 15 pounds average main, it's about 30, then we're going to have starters and wine, and okay, I'll go like 60 pounds, got it. That's the easiest way for us to make that decision. And why did we make a decision to go for average main course? The answer is because the kind of people that use our app, A, are not bad in math, right? They are the bankers, the consultants, the, uh, the people who, who you know, need to make fast decisions about these things, go on to go to these kind of restaurants. Yeah, they, they, they don't mind multiplying by four, right? And the second thing is that it allows you to, to continue the discussion. I am giving you a piece of data, which is true, and now you can decide whether this restaurant suits you depending on the type of meal you want to have. And that was a very important insight for us that we can't actually tell you how much you're going to spend. What we can tell you is a piece of data that then you can communicate with internally and make a, a, a decision yourself. Yes. The third thing I wanted to talk about is the difference between um, constraints and variables. The one thing that people can actually be quite um, uh, the, uh, this is very important from a UX perspective because it informs how you build your UI. And the difference between a variable to a constraint will, will decide where, where in the funnel do you put each one of these elements. And here's what I mean. We, I just talked a second ago about the fact that I actually need only two pieces of data about the restaurant. I need table size and table time. One is a variable and one is a constraint. The variable is the time. Right? If you want to go to eat at 6 and I have a table at 6.15, usually I can squeeze you in, right? You'll, you'll be, usually be fine with it. If you want to go to eat at 8, if you want to dine at 8 o'clock in the evening and I only have a table of, at 9 o'clock in the evening, that might actually work for you as well. 
there's, there, there is some type of volatility in your willingness to actually change your plans based on what the inventory actually is. Whereas the table size is a constraint. You're not going to ditch your girlfriend because I only have a table for, for three, right? <coughs> so that was a very, very, very strong insight for us. It, sounds like, it actually sounds quite sensible but once you say that like that. But for us, we said, OK, we're going to show different table sizes in different times. Everything's going to be fine. But then what we discovered was that actually people were seeing there's a table at 6 o'clock, but that table was only for four people and with two people. So actually, I'm showing you information, and I'm creating, and I'm creating a, um, an experience that is actually quite um, non-optimistic. So uh, non, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, non-optimal or suboptimal. So what we did was we have this fancy filter at the top here, and we are, again, discovery element. So we're not about you doing all the work. We're about us doing the work, curating the list of restaurants. We have a curation algorithm, which I can go into afterwards if anyone's interested. We have all of this stuff about curation that we do for you. You don't have to come in and search and filter and do, you read user reviews. We have no user reviews. We do all of that work. Where, what do we ask you to tell us? We ask you to tell us the day that you're looking for, because since we launched this, we actually went from today to today and tomorrow. We, are, we ask for the sitting, which is, are you looking for afternoon tea? Are you looking for dinner? Are you looking for lunch? Are you looking for breakfast? Are you looking for brunch? And we ask for the number of people that you're actually going to be. Because each one of those is a constraint. If you want to go for lunch, you're not willing to, to go for dinner. Right? That you, you have a certain mindset. Those are the constraints of our experience. So we have to front load them within the funnel. And that's why we, for example, don't have table time here, because we have found that people are actually willing to um, concede on that. Now, can we continue? <coughs> Wait, sorry, I need to do this. Cool. Oh, are we only here? OK. So, so this is, sorry, I, I hope you guys can see the back there, right? So this is, this is the app, and this is how we are, we are built it. And I've been asked to talk about, about the choices we've made and how this relates to food apps and the UX of food apps. And, the, and I've collected a list of issues here that I think would be quite interesting for people who are considering going into food apps and to build them. The first is that uh, food is about experience, it's about ambience, it's about discovery, it's about a aspiration. And you have to tell a story to the person who's purchasing or the person who's looking at whatever you are buying, or you're, whatever you're selling, sorry, in order to get them into it. Well, the way we have done this is that our pictures, I'll take a kitchen table as an example, tell the story of a meal that you're about to have. So when you, when you actually go through these, then you can actually see, so kitchen table is a great restaurant, if, you, if any, any of you know it. It's all around, okay, Amazon Web Services wants to tell me something. Um, <laughs> Kitchen Table is a great restaurant that's literally situated on, the kitchen, on the, uh, the kitchen itself. So you can actually see the people making your food, right? And then you can understand the kind of food that you're going to be getting. <coughs> and we always start off with actually the ambience of the place itself, because we are, again, a, a dining location kind of app, right? We are an experience or an aspiration. So if you go to Lanima, this is the kind of space that you're going to see. And we always try to show you the interior because that's part of the experience. As, and then only do we move to the food itself. Food is great to uh, take pictures of, especially if it's high-end high dining, right? Because it's always, it always looks beautiful. It's always nice. The question is, what's the difference? And if you show the same exact thing over and over again, people say well, I, the, the, the attention to the detail actually gets numb. So that's what we, we try to do here. We actually try um, to get a main course and then a dessert, one after the other, to really give you the feeling of the entire uh, experience. I will tell you that depending on the quality of the pictures of a restaurant, it will, its conversions will change up to 400%. People choose using pictures. People get attached to using pictures. Right. We have had restaurants that were some of the worst performing restaurants, which sent a professional photographer and they are some of our best doing restaurants right now. It is remarkable. Yes? Is it a food picture or the restaurant picture? Uh, it is the restaurant picture, interestingly enough, that has made that 
uh, that specific example. Food is very important as well. Most of these, we have been very fortunate because most of our restaurants have beautiful food pictures. Uh, I think all of them have just sent us professional pictures, and they usually take professional pictures in order to promote themselves. The picture of the space is slightly more challenging, especially in England where sometimes it's in the basement or something else, lighting and whatnot. So we will invest in doing that for our restaurant partners because it's that important. The second thing I wanted to show you, and, and remember where I started off, right? Remember the experience of the people that I were trying to go to? Do I have time? Am I OK? OK. Uh, remember the people that, that I'm trying to um, sell this restaurant to, right? These are people who make fast decisions, right? Uh, all, all of the different stories we hear about time poor and money rich. People want to make decisions very, very quickly. So the amount of content I give them is shown here. This is all the, con this is all the content about that restaurant. You can see 12 pound average main. You can see a small piece of um, content about what the, this restaurant actually is. We only talk about ambiance there. This, and then you see our favorites, which is a list of the food you should try at that restaurant if you're there. If you spend an average of 35 seconds on our um, restaurant detail page, chances are you're going to convert. That's, just, uh, that's how we found this. Why? Because we tell a story through the pictures, which then if you still need a little bit more information, then we, say, uh, then we try to um, make it worth your while through the copy. We, we write all of our own copy. None of this is taken. Now, it's really easy to make these decisions at the beginning. Well, actually, am I really going to write copy for 300 restaurants? I mean, come on. There's Zomato. There's so many of these great services that just give you content for free if you, you know, hit the API and you get a commercial agreement with them. Why would I do that? The answer is because that's what differentiates. If you, for us, if we try to optimize the um, experience for our use case, then we need a completely different set of descriptions about this restaurant. Now I will tell you that sometimes you make mistakes, right? And um, our favorites is one of the best parts about our app. People love to read this and then go and try those, um, and then go try those, um, those restaurants and, the, and those dishes. But there's a very large segment of people that simply need to see the menu. I don't know. I don't know them. I'm not like that. My wife isn't. But there are people in the world that will not go to a restaurant without seeing the menu first. I know it's strange, but it is what it is. And what we found was that we got literally hundreds of emails from people saying, why don't you have menus? Why don't you have menus? Why don't you have menus? At some point, you, you, know, you humbly say, I'm, I, uh, you know, mistake, sorry. We will give you your menus. And what we did was we added menus into the app as well. So this is a, a and then you say to yourself, yeah, OK, but this isn't my use case. This isn't my use case. Well, actually, it is your use case, right? Because if, somebody, if so many people are using your app and saying, we need this as well, then concede, right? You know, you might be right and just, you know, bankrupt afterwards. So do, do yourself a favor and simply listen to these users and what they actually need in order to convert. Once we added this, if somebody clicked on this button and went into the food section, he was five times more likely to convert. And that happened, you know, sometimes these things happen what, like you put them in, and then ne the next day, the matrix just kind of changes. That's what happened with menus. I was the key resistor in menus. I said, that's not our use case. That's not what we do. Think about the person. Think about the consultant in BCG that has 10 seconds. He's going to look through a menu. Yes, he wants to look through a menu. You know, chill. <laughs> right? The, the third thing I wanted to show you about, the, about uh, this screen, and I'm, I'm mindful of time, so just tell me if I'm OK, is that you have to understand that there are constraints to your experience. And the constraints, for example, for us is distance. It's a very big constraint in our, in our business, right? Sometimes these restaurants are far away, but everyone wants to know where they are. So what we do is, nowadays is that we say, OK, so we don't actually show you the distance here, but we do show you the address. But most people, the address doesn't tell them a lot about where it is. Obviously, we say neighborhood here at the top. But then if you go down and you, and you actually pick one of these restaurants, this restaurant could actually be quite far away, right? So when we place the map, you can see that there's a zoom thing here. Wow, does that look close, right? And the reason it looks close is because we just did this zoom effect into this, right? This, let's show you again, right? So Ceviche Old Street, great place, you should go to it, right? And then you can see that we're actually zooming in. And you're like, oh, OK, well, let's just across the corner, fine. Now, that's a really small element, and we're not tricking anyone, right? You can see where it is, everything's fine, you can get directions and go to city map or wherever else to get the directions. What we're trying to do is to move away from your bias about the, the distance and to kind of just give you the information you need. But when you see it on the map, if you'd see it like this initially, 
like that, you'll be like, okay, I'm not going to this place. It's going to be like a half an hour walk or whatever. But then if you just do this, this small animation, then people kind of give you a second, they give it a second thought. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of where we are with this. So can, can we go back to this? Thank you. I'm going to wrap up here and give you the, the anecdotal takeaways that I, I thought would be interesting to share. The first is tell your story through the experience and the pictures. I think I, I displayed that through our app. The second was the curation is important, but respect people's self-validation and desire for a bit of serendipity. Don't control the entire experience. I'll explain that. We have a tremendously cumbersome algorithm that sits on what restaurants we actually show at what point in time. What we discovered was that never mind what we do there, because we are trying to be so pinpointed at what your personal experience is, the effect that I, just, I told you about with our first users who looked at the app five times a day and saw the same inventory stayed the same. The inventory was static on the app because we said, no, no, we know exactly what restaurants to show you. But some people just want to see a stream of what's going on. So now we actually have some randomizing um, elements in our platform just to give you a bit of serendipity, just to say, wow, okay, this, is, this thing is live and it's changing, it's dynamic. And there's no, uh, the, the whole purpose of, rand of randomizing this is that you actually have no control over it. So what people, you actually lose a bit of control over what inventory people see, what restaurants people see. But that actually increased conversions quite a bit because people are then more focused on exploring and enjoying it rather than saying, okay, I saw this one before and you're, you're, you're pissing me off. Come on, stop showing me the same stuff. The second, sorry, anecdotal point, how did we solve the issue that everyone thinks he's a foodie but, no, but most of them actually don't know anything about restaurants? The answer is that in every list that we show, we give you one of the very well-known restaurants. Most times you open our app, you will find Hakkasan, Yawacha, Nobu, somewhere in that list. And the reason it's there is not because we think it's the best restaurant for you, it's because we know you know that restaurant. So when you judge us and say, wait a second, I don't know any of these restaurants and I'm a big foodie, so these guys are probably non-credible, right? They probably just gave their friends who have restaurants a good placement on the app. Then you scroll down and you're like, oh wow, Nobu. Okay, now these guys are credible, right? So the way we solve this is by respecting the fact that, you th that, that people think they know something about what we're doing, so we're showing them the inventory that they think they should see, and then we're showing them additional inventory that they really want to discover, because otherwise they just they think we are not credible in what we do. Um, I count the different use cases. I told you about favorites versus menus. Get the placement of your offering right, but it might not be trivial. Um, I mentioned this before. An app is not enough. You must have back-end architecture to support it. Guys, I don't know. What, what, I'm very happy whether I'm going to stick around afterwards if anyone wants to kind of chat. But I don't know where you guys are in different stages of your app or, or your project. If there is one thing I can tell you that you need to account for is back-end scalable architecture. That sounds boring as hell. It is extremely important because as you move from 50 to 5,000 users, the entire thing changes completely. And from 5,000 users to 150,000 users, it's a completely different ballgame. If you don't think about these things, the beginning, what you find yourself doing is just building everything from scratch. This is, what, this is the backend architecture of our system currently. And each one of those is, is a server that we're, that we're managing. And the reason we have all of this, and the reason I'm showing you this, is because what we are optimizing for is zero latency. Zero latency means that if you book on our app, every single handset gets a notification immediately that changes the inventory on, your, on their app as well. So there's no point in time where anybody can book a table that somebody else has already booked. Think about it, right? We have, again, those last few tables. So if two people try simultaneously to book them, and then they both come to this restaurant expecting a booking, it's a disaster for us. So our entire architecture was built around zero latency. And the more we scaled, now we have 345 restaurants, the more this became a, sim a gigantic project. So that's something that I would um, advise to talk on as well. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Does anyone who's in the back want to take them a moment to move up, if you'd like? Or are you all good back there? If you don't have a seat, there are plenty. Don't be shy. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I also forgot to mention 
that we are tweeting from Food UX Design. Uh, we have a lovely lady from uh, London Food Tech Week in the back there who's tweeting. So if you want to tweet or just follow the conversation, uh, you can do that there. Um, and next we have uh, Malwin from Cook Booth. <coughs> Hi. Before, before I actually get um, get started, I wanted to know who of you is currently working on an app or on a website. Wow. And who is planning to do it soon? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so first of all, a little bit about myself. I started in food um, roughly 11 years ago. It wasn't quite food tech. Um, I started working for fast-moving consumer goods in advertising. I started as an account manager for Rickley's um, chewing gum and then um, ended up being the global account director and um, brand strategist for Danone. And Food culture is very different from foodie culture, obviously. So um, I think you'll feel familiar with this. We are all foodies. We are all documenting what we eat constantly. When we started, there were 20 million food recipes or recipes with the tag food on Instagram. Today is 140 million. And I mean, behind all those plates, there's obviously somebody who prepared it, who prepared um, this dish. So. We wanted to create a connection between the foodies and the chefs, um, giving chefs a platform and a space to actually document and express their creativity, to be able to like, con um, connect with this whole foodie movement. So we decided to build a tool for them that made it really easy and intuitive to document their recipes through an app. The concept is super simple. It's step-by-step -step photo recipes. It's kind of an Instagram for, for recipes, so our goal was to build an app that made it very easy to create a beautiful recipes. Um, most recipe sites were and still are um, not, not very beautiful, even though it has a lot, a lot of things have, have, have changed over the past three years. And um, so our platform is actually not only a website, it's, it's also a web. It's not only an app, it's also a website where you can follow those step-by-step -step photo recipes with very easy to follow instructions. And this is not only digital, it's also, it has applications in the restaurants where chefs are documenting their recipes, they are training their teams if they want, if they're doing a catering for a thousand people and want the same dish prepared the same way 1,000 times, so the easiest way is to actually print it and, and have somebody follow it. Um, so what Cookbooth is today, it is um, a digital portfolio for chefs and for foodies, where they can upload all the recipes, they have their own profile, um, where they can expose their cooking and, and connect to a global community of, of chefs and foodies. Our user experience is based on four sections. Soon it will be five. But the main, the main part of this is kitchen. We wanted to take the offline world actually into our app. So the place where you're cooking is your kitchen. So we call the recipe creation part of our, of our app kitchen. Um, when you log in, you will go to explore. This is where you discover all the new recipe. You have a personalized recipe, recipe feed based on your interests, based on the people you follow. You have your library because it, it's the library in your home where you actually keep your cooking books. So there you will have your own books. Uh, you will have your own recipes, but also the ones that you add from other users. And then you have the section of chefs, where we have two kinds of users. Actually, the black ones are the chefs and the gray ones are the foodies. So you can right away see if it's, if it's a chef or a foodie recipe. But this is how we started. Um, that was the very first um, concept that we scribbled down with the idea to create a platform where 
we could document the culinary knowledge of the world. We could have everyone, chefs and foodies, document their recipes. We started from um, the current um, user behavior. So you would go online and actually search for recipes. But we wanted to take a different approach to roughly 95% of the existing recipe sites that are all about search. We wanted to create a recipe creation platform or tool. This was our very first um, design approach. It was you cook. It was all about kind of a YouTube, your profile where you, where you upload your recipes. We had the step-by-step. -step. Then we, I mean, the most important part of it was all about recipe creation. So th those, were, those were the first wireframes we scribbled down where we decided that the center of our app would be kitchen, would be the part where you, would act, where you are creating your recipes. Through picture, you could record audio, add the text, and then assemble a step-by-step -step photo recipe. This is why the second design concept that we were working on had kitchen at the, at, the, um, at the center. It was called cook booth because it was all about like taking pictures of your, of your cooking. This is how you would record audio um, so you didn't have to actually write um, the descriptions <coughs> down. And then we, we started laying out a sitemap. So it was not only kitchen, it was this is where we decided we, need, we needed to have an explore, a news feed. We needed to have a library where you could um, save all those recipes that you would be creating and that you would be finding on the, on the app. So that was our third design concept. And I'm explaining this um, because design was, is pr very much at the center uh, um, of our product still today. And we were very closely working with designers in the beginning. So every evolution, we, um, we put them right away into design. We wanted to make it very visual and very easy and intuitive to, to upload your recipes. And you can see a little bit the evolution from the first ones to here. Then we started um, detailing the whole technical architecture, like what would be the user journeys of this app. We turned this into wireframes. Um, this is the complete um, app before we actually then went into the final design with the final branding. Um, one, one thing that was really important for us um, is what you see at the top, that is Cookbooth and the name. So we wanted every user, every chef or foodie to have their own Cookbooth, to have their own logo. And so that you could actually brand your recipes with your own name. You could put um, yeah, your name on it. And it was very important that we had both the food lovers, who then later were the foodies and the pros. This was then the the actual final design. So you can see the name with the logo of Cookbooth around it. So every user actually gets their own name when they log into the app and when they see their recipes. This is how it looked when we, when we launched it. And we launched in 2013. So that was when Apple still was in iOS 6. So you had like the, all the volumes and we launched an app with a very flat, with a flat design. And in combination with the design, it was an innovative approach in, in the food sections of the app store. We actually got promoted as best new app, not only in the food section, but on the home banner in Spain and in, and in Latin America. But we were also promoted. This is from the UK, from New Zealand. We were the number one food app during several weeks in, in 82 countries. Then a few weeks later, um, iOS 7 got launched. And even though it wasn't our initial um, intention to, to have an iOS 7 kind of design, we, we got promoted widely and had tons of downloads. But what's also true that those were a lot of designers and people looking around the app store um, looking for for the new new apps and for the design, so they were were not necessarily foodies. I must say that. So um, 
Yeah, we were. I already said that. So today we have about 250,000 downloads, of which 160,000 foodies have registered, and 11,000 chefs, and together they have created more than um, 15,000 recipes. The um, app is available in seven languages and has been featured, apart from a lot of obviously local um, media in Spain, where our company was, was originally based, um, in a few international in, international platforms. So um, a few lessons that we have learned during, during this journey. First of all, it's so obvious, and Dan was talking about it, but you really have to know your customers. So you should speak to more customers that you actually want or would like to, even obviously before you start building your product, but also while you're building it and after you've built it, there is a great another startup from Spain, actually, that's called Typeform. It's great for doing um, customer surveys. And while you build your database, you can constantly engage with your customers and ask them and build like a tight-knit community of your power users. Speak to them. Find out what they love. And, and they really like to help you. And all the feedback that you get through your feedback site is really, really helpful. And you should listen to them. So. Before starting Cookbooth, like we knew that chefs were actually supposed to use this as recipe management. So this is kind of Windows 95 Excel files where you have to introduce like a lot of data in order to do recipe, um, to document your recipes and do recipe costing. But then chefs are creative guys. Like they are artists, they like um, all the visual part, they like to taste and to smell. So there was a huge disconnect between like existing softwares and, and what we were trying to build. Um, you probably know this book and it's, it's, a great, it's a great starting point if, you, if you're planning to start a company or an app. Um, do it by the book, I think it's great. Um, I also think I also believe that they talk, he talks a lot about how you don't need to be, build something perfect, but I think the design is really something that should be at the center of what you're building because you don't want to have an ugly, ugly app in your, in, on your phone. You don't want to interact with it. And sometimes it's very, like we went through so many designs and we were, it took us five designers to actually find the one that we liked um, to, we evolved a lot, a lot the concept, the design. We simplified it, and and I think that was really crucial to, like, the, obviously to the initial um, promotion by Apple, to to pay a lot of attention to to the detail and to the design. If you're like me, if you're not a tech person, um, learn everything you can about tech. What Dan was saying about the back end and the architecture, make sure it's scalable. Especially if, you're, if you want to lead a tech team and you're not a technical person, learn about agile development, learn about how to organize sprints. Um, when I started, I didn't even know what an API was. So it was a long, it was a learning process. Very interesting one to know like how to store your images in S3 because it was cheaper, where to have your servers. Um, and we got through, especially in the beginning when we got so heavily promoted and had like 20,000 downloads a day, um, our service structure wasn't at all prepared for that. So be prepared if Apple calls you and they, and they want to promote your app. Um, Dan actually also mentioned this, um, don't rely on your users if your platform is about user-generated content because you will end up with 90% of content looking like this. And you want to make sure that when you open the app that everything looks really beautiful and that, and, and that you give those users also the chance to be seen and to get their likes. And, but you have to be very careful like how you organize your algorithm and how many of those recipes you actually want to show. And another clear example, except from Dan's, how much more, like the, the most um, 
the, the restaurants you were saying there before that didn't have professional pictures weren't get, getting any reservations. The same was true for Airbnb. The founders in the beginning, to, they went to the apartments and took the pictures. And we are doing a mix of, every, uh, of, of both. So we are taking pictures ourselves. We are sending photographers there. We are doing a lot of work online and offline tutorials with the chefs to actually learn how to take nice recipes, uh, how to take nice food pictures. Um, and we do something else. We um, offer bloggers, food bloggers, to visit chefs in their restaurants and create a photo, recipes to, photo recipe together. So it's actually quite, kind of a nice interaction where bloggers are looking for content and the chefs are learning from, from taking nice food pictures and are getting promotion on the, on the blog from the, from the bloggers. Um, this, this is a sentence that when I was working in advertising, I was coordinating 35 countries, um, the, the communication 35 countries, and every, like, Romania always wanted to reinvent the wheel, wheel and do their communication, their own advertising campaigns. But there's no point of, like, starting from scratch if they're, like, bigger um, players in the market already doing a great job. So just... Instagram is kind of the standard of UX and how they organize like their, their tap bar. It's really something that we can all learn from. So I, I really recommend you like to look at as many apps as possible. Look what you like, look what you don't like. It's not about not being innovative, but you don't have to make up like how to make the most effe effective pop-ups or push notifications because other people are already doing that. Just a very little example. That was our first login screen. Um, sign up, sign in, the sign in with Facebook, and then looking at all the other apps, if you have directly, the Facebook connect button and the email bot um, button. Um, we, we changed from a 60% conversion from downloads to signups to a 90% conversion rate. One of the tem early temptations for us was to develop the Android app because we had 60,000 downloads in the matter of a few weeks and everybody was asking, where's Android, where's Android? And we, we had the opportunity to actually then launch the Android app um, following the iOS app, but make sure that you really have the bandwidth in terms of the team um, and in terms of the runway of your, of your money to actually launch this. I mean, or vice versa, obviously, if you start with Android. And also because it takes, a, it takes a little bit the focus away from first learning and iterating and really looking into the data and optimizing first your first app before going into launching the second platform. Very quick summary. Um, know your customers. Follow Lean Startup. It's a great book. Um, another great book is actually Lean Analytics that I recommend you following up this book and learn about tech if you're not a technical person. And in terms of the don'ts, I mean, your product is so much more than just the technology. Your product is the app itself. It is the content. It is the users. And it's also the reliability of your service. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and don't launch your second platform too early. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so if both of you would like to come up here, uh, we can do some Q&A. Cool. Um, one mic, you can be here, whatever you want. Any questions? Um, how does Cookbooth make their money? Um, we're selling our software to restaurants and hotels um, as professional recipe management software. So it's not through the app. Um, I was wondering if there's any 
fundamental differences between your website and your app for Cookbooth? The, the, the use cases are very different, so the app is actually to take the pictures and then easily upload them if you want to, but the website is obviously much more convenient if you are a professional user and like, no, even a foodie user and want to like introduce the text, it's much more, much more convenient. And the website has more functions, especially for our enterprise users. Um, my questions for, oh, are we just doing questions for you now, or is it no, either? No. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> my, my questions for Dan. Um, actually, I have a couple, but I'll just start with two. Um, how, what has really changed on your sort of UX um, um, as you've shifted from showing availability today and then going from that to today and tomorrow? And then um, how successful has your Facebook advertising been? Because I see it all the time on my... It's probably not successful. Um, so um, what have we changed? So what we did was we launched our that top bar that I showed you with all of the different things I called constraints with today and tomorrow. That was one of the big things we did there. Um, we, we did not change anything when it comes to the UI element apart from that. Obviously, we have the today and tomorrow. And our app update for Apple, you know, we have that, there's a description there. We just said, you can now book for tomorrow. Boom. Right. That was it. But there was an issue about, wait a second, what happens if you have restaurants that show availability today and they show, and then you toggle to tomorrow, you see exactly the same restaurants. And that was, a ch again, as always with these things, the challenge is actually on the back end and not on the front end. You had to show a, again, a random element to, or a, a discovery element to the availability that you're showing so that people won't feel as if you have the same number of 10, 15, 20 restaurants, which you're showing day in, day out. You probably have like a schedule for them or something. And you just say, you show them whatever day and whatever night anybody comes into the app. So the challenge there was to say, okay, if you want a, a table for today, what am I showing? If you want a table for tomorrow, how do I change that in a way that is still relevant for you, if that makes sense? And what happens if you actually see a table for today that you like, and then you toggle to tomorrow, because that's when you want to go out, and it's not there, because our algorithm screwed it up. And so how do, we, how do we get that back quickly? So we had a lot of challenges around the liquidity and around the question of how do you show, what do you show and how do you show it? That was. That. Oh, you had the Facebook question as well. Um, we have found Facebook and Twitter to be extremely effective when it comes to finding the segments of users who would relate to our app. I can tell you that we do the lion's share of our um, marketing spend through Facebook and Twitter. We have found that to be very, very effective. Um, apologies if it's spamming you. Yeah. I'm joking. It's a, I, I understand that uh, these things have a tendency to escalate very quickly. And, Sorry, mate. Uh, Hi, um, this is a question for both of you. Actually, I'm interested in like the starting process. When you first got your idea, who did you have to contact, and how did you actually manage to get the funding that you, it was required? Was the prototype was it working? Did you just design the looks of the app? What did you do exactly? Was it with friends? Other people yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I, I should have mentioned this actually before in terms of the timeline. We, our four-week testing period was in our second year of MBA. So we were still students. And then we validated our KPIs and we built a business plan and we went and pitched during the tail end of our second year, which means we graduated and the week before we graduated, we closed the round. So we had the money to essentially graduate right into the startup and, and run with it. But we started this project, I want to say, eight months before we, we subsequently raised. Um, and I think that's the way you do it, right? You, you kind of, you, you test and you build, and then on top of that, then you raise seed once you've actually validated some parts of, um, of your business plan, I think. Um, we 
actually we're looking for a technical co-founder in the beginning, hoping to, to get him or her on board. When, um, but we really realized that obviously freelancers, they have to make money and couldn't afford um, working on this project. So what we decided, the three founders, we financed the like the MVP of the app, um, launched it, got heavily promoted by Apple, and then raised funding after that. Yeah, so if you, if you build a beautiful app that, that serves a purpose, um, we have, I, I can give you five examples of this, right? With literally like 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds, you can get featured in 168, 186 countries like we were in Apple. And it was, it suddenly becomes its own thing. It's like, it snowballs into that. But you need to get that thing really right. That's the point of design and everything. Expend your time really kind of doing that, yeah. Yeah, hi guys. Um, question about UX, funnily enough. Uh, maybe either or both of you can pick this up. I'm wondering, do you, do you have anybody in-house that's a UX specialist? Um, I know this is a two-part question. First of all, did you hire people in thinking just about UX? Did you use consultancy? Was it a design company? And then also, do you have any separation in your heads between practical UX and the conceptual stuff that goes on before you even start putting pen to paper and doing stuff with visuals? I had a slide on, on the team, actually, but, well, I can, I can just explain it. Um, so, we, the, the designer that finally ended up doing our, our app, he, is, he has a background in, in branding and then web design. It was actually the first app he ever did. Um, so, we did the whole conceptual part, um, together with my partner, who was a creative director, and myself, ourselves, so we did the wireframes and everything, um, and then had the support of, back to your question, to our um, external app development team in the beginning that have obviously successfully built and launched several apps to the promote, yeah, up to the promotion of Apple. So it was kind of like the result of the teamwork. And then after we raised funding, we, um, the UX designer is still kind of an external guy who comes and works with that when we're doing big, um, big updates. And we have now um, a CTO and an iOS developer in-house. So yeah, I, okay, I formulated an answer, I think. The, um, on our end, what we did was that once we raised our money, we got a very, very talented designer who is a UI UX designer. I don't know how he would categorize himself. He's just a very talented guy in for two weeks. And at that stage, again, we were about eight months into this, so we had a very strong sense of what we actually wanted, and we already had the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we had the alpha or the uh, prototype version already out there, so we knew what to do there. Uh, we have never actually hired a UX designer, full time or part time. We all, all of our design, all of our UX is in house, and I think that at the beginning we did not have a separation between high level. Um, UX kind of conceptualization and understanding of flows and the actual uh, process to, to build the wireframes. And as we developed, then the conceptualization is still a very much a part of the entire, like the core team that kind of thinks this through. And I, as the product lead now, are more in charge of leading that from conceptualization or creation, ideation rather, down to uh, funneling it into the app as feature request and then through the, to the sprints. That, that helps. Uh, yeah, just oh, just a question about your photos. So uh, all of the restaurants looked empty in the photos on un Uncover, but obviously you're selling the idea of scarcity. I just wondered if you if you tested empty photos of restaurants versus full minus like one spare table, so the person can envision themselves in that spare table. So, um, we we did not A/B test that. What we did, we do have a kind of tiles section or a category section where we have like hotspots. So we have a, a full restaurant. The only problem is that when you have restaurants that are full, we put full restaurants on the app to see what it looks like, and it looks like a full restaurant. You can't see anything, right? Just you see people, and you're much, very much focused on the faces of the people, whether you recognize them or kind of things like that. <laughs> and it just became a completely different thing. So empty, there's something freakish about empty restaurants, um, unless the pictures are, are, are right. Unless you can say, okay, I understand kind of, I can understand the ambience of this place through this picture that they're now delivering me. If we get that wrong, it's just a creepy, creepy empty space, I agree, right? So it, it's important that we are very conscious of the fact that people aren't used to just seeing these very empty spaces. 
Me again. How do we make money? <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, when I'm ordering food online, reviews play a big part in me deciding what I'm going to order. Um, have you thought about um, bringing reviews into your app um, or integrating TripAdvisor, something like that? Reviews? Yes. Yes, excellent. So um, if you book with us, you will have a review flow where it's very similar to other review flows now is a five-star thing. And if you give us less than three, three stars or less, we have a subsequent flow, which is then what went wrong, and you can take and explain to us. And we take that feedback very, very seriously. We answer each one of them. Please don't test us, but we do answer each one of them. And um, we take reviews very, very seriously internally. We had to make a call on whether we are going to uh, show user content on our app or not. It, it, it's, an, it's a strategic decision. And we decided to go against that because what we are doing right now is we are differentiating the use case, right? If you are a person who, who if you are a, a trip advisor and there are others, right? Um, um, Zomato is a great example as well. If you're that kind of user who really wants to read what other people have to say about this app, you have many places to channel those energies to, right? We are not trying to be a catch-all um, solution. We're trying to be a fast pace, come in, see the restaurant, our average um, app open to booking time is 55 seconds, right? That's what we're optimizing for, right? There are people who say, I trust these guys, okay, I get it, what's this, Peruvian, sorted, it's great, wait, yeah, okay, I will need that, boom. That's kind of where we are. Now, there are other use cases in the world, I'm not saying there aren't, I think they're all, everyone, every use case is legitimate, we just, it's not what we can do better than others, so we're trying to focus on what, what we do. Tell me, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. This is for Daniel. Did you do any A-B testing uh, around swiping versus scrolling? We have so many A-B testing. I'm not sure. Swiping versus scrolling. No, we did not. We did a, a, a very large test around how do clicks change depending on the, on the number of scrolls you have, so how many restaurants essentially we give you. Interestingly enough, you think that the top, whatever's above the fold is what's getting booked, right, uh, clicked, and whatever's under the fold, people don't care about, right? Like Amazon has all of these statistics about it. What you discover is that people press the top two, and then they scroll all the way down, and they press the bottom two. <laughs> That's just a, a fact of life with our app. So number, when we had 10 restaurants, number one and two, and number nine and 10 were by far clicked more than anything else. So, and number nine and 10 were actually not great suggestions for you, because we put them in order. Funnily enough, right? So we actually changed that. So the number one and two, and the number nine and ten are the most interesting ones for you. We had a lot. Of, we have a lot of data about that. But so that's what I have. Hi, I just love both of your stories. It feels like you've gone through a real journey for both of you. There's been really a lot of iterations, um, and it seems to me you've really had a chance to get to know your customers, um, you've listened to people, uh, you've done what I would call um, really getting to know the people who are using your apps, um, UX research. But I get the feeling there's a lot of people who just build stuff and don't take the chance to listen to their customers. What would you say to those people? Read Eric Rice Lean Startup. Um, because then you... I mean, there's a big risk of that. You're building something that people actually don't want. And getting to product market fit um, was when we realized how can we build like a better recipe management system for chefs, um, actually through talking to them. And that we actually kind of evolved from an app to a more web-based platform. So I, I, I will say something slightly different. I think that... You, there, is a, there is definitely an important part of the UX journey and as a product manager and in your role to talking to your users, understanding their pains and why you are or are not solving them. I don't think that from a lot of my uh, discussions with users, they necessarily know what they want. What they do know is where is the, where is the pain, right? What's, what's the, and then it's, it's your own journey. And a lot of times the solutions that we find either are completely wrong, and I have many, many examples of that, or they actually fit really, really well, and then you keep them. And the fact is that in a, in a startup, in a lean startup like ours, 
you don't have time to validate any one of these assumptions with a cohort of users, and then you just ship, right? And you pray, and you A-B test the hell out of everything, right? And then you, if, if something goes terribly wrong, always make your A-B tests back-end triggered, right? That's maybe the most important thing I will say today. Make your A-B tests back-end triggered, which means that if something goes wrong, you can immediately switch everybody to the correct version, right? Not front-end triggered, because then it's going to take eight days to change it, and you're done. So assuming that you can do that quickly, if you break something, and as long as you're on top of your numbers and you can see it, you can very quickly change whatever you're doing and then make it better. But we, I mean, we obsess about these things. We have buttons that we have like six A-B tests for and whatever. If we would actually ask users what's better, we wouldn't get anywhere with this. So we ask users about what their pain is, what, the, what their issues are, and how we can, and we try to improve them. But sometimes they say things which, and they, with, you know, the vigor, and they really, th really believe that this is the right thing for you, but they just don't understand why this isn't right. And the best example I can always give about this is people constantly come back to me and say, why, do I want, can't, why can't I just search your restaurants? Right. Why can't I search? And while we are introducing search through something else now, the fact is that the day I put in search is the day that I have just another booking app that anyone can go into and look at any restaurant they want. The discovery, the feeling, the experience. While sometimes it is slightly more cumbersome because you actually want to go to Lanima and you know exactly what table you want, you know exactly what time, and you know that Uncover has that table. It's so frustrating that you actually have to like, kind of look for it. That's, that is a use case. But you can, I can think of at least eight other apps or services that you can find what you're looking for. If, you're, if you don't know what you want tonight and actually you want to go out and, shit, I didn't book anything, there's one app that does that better than everyone else, I hope. Right? And that's what I'm trying to stay true to. Now, a lot of my users come back and say, give me search, give me search. And these are good users, right? They book 20, 30 times. They're like, wow. And I said to them, you know, it's just, you have, that. like, what, what do you do when you're frustrated with me? And they say, what do you mean? I go to that, this other website and do it. I say, exactly, right? So I don't, I don't want to compete with that. Right? I want to stick to what I know how to do. So there is a point where I listen, or we listen to our users, and there's a point where we say, we're going to stick to our guns. This is what we believe in. I hope that any more UX related questions? Sir? Are you ever uh, tempted to book a load of tables on open table then cancel at the last minute so they appear on cover? <laughs> Absolutely not. Come on, that's preposterous. I would never in my life. We, our, uh, nobody asked how we make money. Uh, apparently, it's, it's, it's apparent. We make money off bookings, huh? Yes, revelation. Um, our restaurants are our clients, right? Our, our users are what we are selling to our restaurants, right? When you, if we don't respect our restaurants and don't give them a platform that they use authentically, they discover we're just you know, front-loading them from, from another source, we are done in this industry. Everyone talks to everybody, we're done. So we are very, very vigilant when it comes to treating our customers correctly. Just one more question. Um, okay. Right, um, how do you get the real-time reservations from the restaurant? Do you, are you connected to the restaurant? We have three ways of doing this. What we have is a integration with some integration partners that uh, give us uh, <coughs> access to the API to the back-end booking software. So the second that the table comes available, it is automatically populated on our app. The other way is that there are a handful of restaurants. Uh, great examples are Kitty Fishes, if somebody knows it, one of the best, uh, well-known now, very hot restaurant. They actually put up tables on a daily basis. So they will look at their restaurant and say, ah, one table, put it on cover, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a manual version, 100% manual version, and a 100% automated version. And what we have found, and this is another discovery, is that restaurants are actually quite good at forecasting how, they're going to, uh, how many tables they're going to have on a given day or week. So we give them the opportunity to sit down on a Monday and say, yeah, third week of October, it's kind of like, it wasn't busy last week, I want to have two tables on Thursday. And when they do that, they are usually 99% correct. Um, High-end or independent restaurants are quite disorganized in many aspects. Yeah. What they know very, very well is their deal flow, or is their, is their, is their booking flow. So what we found is that they can actually project it with quite a bit of accuracy. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you guys so much, that was great. Um, we do have some more drinks upstairs, so if you wanna stick around for a bit, you can do that. And uh, thank you very much.